I think the way, the best way to do this and committee uh, correct me here if you think there might be a different way of doing this is to first hear, so we're talking about kind of this huge issue of mail out ballots and how that worked and should we continue to do it. So what I think makes sense is to hear first from um, the, what I call the good government groups, the VPIRG, the Campaign for Vermont, the League of Cities, <laughs> League of Women Voters. They're kind of the good, what I consider good government groups. <laughs> then hear from the parties, that would be Bruce and Martha. Then um, the, from VLCT and the clerks, and then get into the kind of the details of what it would be. But hear first kind of the, the general feeling and the concept and should we go forward with it? Shouldn't we go forward with it? That kind of thing. And then get into more of the details and Will can then start, um, Will and the clerks can start listing the details to us that we may need to pay attention to and then people can comment on those. Does that make sense to anybody? Sure. Okay, well, hearing no objections then, we'll start with um, Paul. So uh, kind of general concepts and, and we will get more into details and specific things that we have to pay attention to if we do this or don't do it. Okay, thanks. So Paul? Yes, uh, well, thanks so much, Madam Chair. Again, members of the committee, Paul Burns of VPIRG. And um, I, I should say that uh, my organization joined with uh, a number of others in submitting uh, some uh, testimony and comments, uh, specifically with respect to this question of universally mailed ballots and whether that should become a permanent feature of uh, Vermont's general elections moving forward. These organizations were all strongly in favor of uh, making that policy permanent. And, and what we're talking about in broad strokes is, is what, what, what uh, was put together in rapid fashion, we must say, for the 2020 election. Uh, all credit to, uh, to the parties uh, who we've talked about before, but to this committee being one of them, and then obviously those who implemented the policy at the local level and with the Secretary of State's office. These organizations, again, that that uh, joined together in offering the comments, in, in addition to VPER, was AARP Vermont, ACLU of Vermont, Conservation Law Foundation, Disability Rights Vermont, League of Women Voters Vermont, Rights and Democracy, Vermont Conservation Voters, Vermont NEA. And then there were two organizations that came on after we submitted, which is Justice for All um, uh, and Main Street Alliance of Vermont. Um, and over the course of the summer, too, we also had um, other uh, organizations and businesses who were strongly in favor of uh, implementing vote by mail. And that included Vermont Businesses for Social Responsibility, uh, Ben and Jerry's, Burton, uh, Seventh Generation, among others. So I just wanted to mention that there are many um, uh, organizations and diverse organizations with, a, with an interest here. The idea, of course, for 2020 was that we wanted to have <laughs> an election in the midst of a pandemic that was safe, safe for voters and safe for poll workers and, and other uh, local officials. And, um, and it made sense uh, to implement this, this policy and approach that had already been used effectively in a handful of other states around the country. Um, and it was important to us, uh, I should say, that we preserved uh, even while implementing mailed out ballots to all active registered voters, that we preserve the opportunity uh, and choice for people to be able to vote in person as well. And that is particularly important for some communities. Um, some folks uh, with certain disabilities uh, find it uh, particularly important, for instance, to, for them to be able to vote independently, that they have this opportunity to vote in person at a polling place. Uh, New Americans uh, uh, expressed a strong interest in being able to preserve that in part because of the translation services that are made available um, uh, in person. And so, uh, so even as we press to make permanent the idea that people should receive at their home uh, these mailed ballots, um, uh, having the opportunity to vote in person is, uh, at least for the foreseeable future, an important element that we think uh, should be preserved as well. 
But let's remember, and you've heard some of these numbers before, but Vermont broke all participation records in the midst of this pandemic. Um, some 45,000 more Vermont, Vermonters voted in 2020 than had ever voted before. Um, uh, nearly 73% uh, of, of, of potential voters actually took advantage of their right to vote. Um, uh, three quarters of them voted early. Uh, most of them taking that ballot that they received at home and putting it in the mail, but a number of folks obviously you taking advantage of the drop boxes that were available. We think that was important as well, or and some bringing it to their clerks or voting in person, even a small number of them. And so this is a policy. I mean, if it can work, uh, <laughs> let me step back. Those states that had implemented prior to the pandemic, this uh, voting by mail policy, uh, a lot of them took years uh, to implement it. They maybe started with pilot projects and lots of public education over a long period of time. And while we didn't have that exactly, Vermont was building on a, um, a, an important history of many advantages that we had. Some 30% of Vermont voters had typically voted early in, in, in more normal times in past general elections. And so it wasn't a foreign concept, um, this ability. Um, and uh, so, uh, so we were kind of building on that plus the idea that we allowed people, we've always, or for some time now, allowed people to participate by voting early in the process. So that wasn't a new feature uh, for folks. Uh, we've obviously had other advantages, automatic registration and election day or same day registration too. So these are all things that were in place um, that I think helped make it possible to implement a, a policy like this without that longer lead time. Um, and, uh, and I think the fact that we had relatively few, as a, as a percentage of the overall voters, uh, relatively few uh, ballots uh, that were defective um, is something um, uh, to celebrate. Uh, I, I've said, I think we can do more to try to uh, address that through curing and other things, but I think it really was impressive that we had a relatively small percentage of defective ballots, lots of public education. And, um, and while we don't know exactly how many may have come in after the election, we, we know that, gosh, there was great work done by the Secretary of State's office, the local officials, and many organizations to encourage people to get those ballots sent in early. I have to, you know, we just have to recognize that that was an important success as well. And so, uh, and, and few, if any, um, uh, you know, we haven't seen evidence of fraud. We haven't seen evidence of many of the things that folks were concerned about, or some people at least were concerned about or raising objections about early on. And so I think almost an unmitigated success is what we see um, to move forward on a faster than uh, normal timeline. You know, let's remember one year ago, this was not being talked about in your committee. This idea that we were gonna have vote by mail for 2020. Uh, what many people considered, you know, the most important election of our lifetime. Uh, so to be able to adopt that as rapidly uh, as, as the state did, um, great, great credit. And uh, so now comes the question, should we keep that or not? And from our perspective, it would, it would essentially represent um, a, uh, a retreat from a policy that we know works well to engage more voters in the process. It would, it would make it more difficult, in other words, uh, for people to vote and participate um, as they choose uh, by removing this, um, uh, this approach to voting, by, uh, by not sending every active registered voter a, a ballot to their home. And we see no, no reason uh, to retreat from a policy like this that worked and worked really well. Um, uh, and so, you know, at a time when uh, in some places, you know, it's, it is still challenging to get people to vote. We're always looking for ways to, to engage more people. Fundamentally, we believe that democracy works best when more people participate. This policy is one of those tools to help make it easier for people to participate, help to get more people involved in the process. There's always more education work that we can do. We're committed to continuing that effort. But I think as a fundamental policy, making uh, sure that those ballots are, are automatically sent out to registered voters, making sure that um, there are multiple options for returning those ballots, including the drop boxes and, and the postage, uh, prepaid postage on the envelopes, um, and making sure, again, that 
once they're received, there's pre canvas and so forth. We've talked about that in other places, but I think those are the fundamental elements that we would like to see uh, preserved and, and continue to move forward because they worked. And finally, Madam Chair, I would just say we've we've done, uh, as I think I mentioned in earlier testimony, we reached out to some of our members. We received lots of good responses. Uh, oh, well over a hundred people responded to say how much they appreciated um, having this opportunity to receive their ballots at home. And um, obviously tens of thousands of Vermonters filled out their ballots at home and returned them that way when they had never done so before. And lots of folks felt that, you know, in addition to being safer in a pandemic, um, that it gave them an opportunity to, to be thoughtful um, about their ballots as they're, as they're sitting at their kitchen table and really considering their choices and they aren't rushed and, you know, nobody's, obviously nobody's looking over the shoulder when they're voting, but it's just, it's a different process. You can really take the time, you can do the research that you want to. And, and I just think it's worth mentioning that many of uh, our members raised that as a particular issue of, of interest for them, uh, something that they felt more comfortable about and felt like an, a better informed voter. Um, and they felt really good about that. So, uh, so ease of voting, greater participation, um, and more thoughtful, uh, informed voters seems like a winning policy to us and one we would like to preserve. Thank you. And I will first, of, before we move on to Pat, I will apologize because I left Audrey out when I talked about the good government groups. So um, I apologize for that. And just so that you know that we have, um, I've made sure that the administration is aware that these conversations are going on and they have open invitation to join us and weigh in whenever they want. Um, mainly, I think probably just to listen to the conversations, but I just wanted you to, to be aware of that. So, Pat? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I am uh, president of the Campaign for Vermont Board of Directors. We did submit uh, a letter supporting mm -hmm. certainly the voter checklist and, and sending uh, ballots to uh, registered voters. We also um, talked about the importance of making sure that voter checklist is scrubbed and is, um, is accurate as far as who's, who is registered to vote. Um, but I think what Paul said was right on the money. I think the more people that wanna get involved and vote and feel confident about voting, I think that's an important, I don't know what can be done about that, whether it's education or more transparency, whatever that means, but people need to feel confident that that the that the vote is their vote and it's being received and uh, recorded. And I think maybe if we can, the Secretary of State's office can talk about. I think it's called My Voter. Uh, maybe Chris Winters can have My Voter, where where that shows that your ballot's been received and it's not. Um, it's been accepted, and I think that's important for people to know that that exists and to check. Um, how their vote is being received and counted. So we are very supportive of uh, mailing ballots to Vermonters. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. I thought we had lost you there for a little while because oh. I saw that your symbol came up and it said Ben Kingsley. Oh, he's on. Um, he maybe want to speak as well. He's I'm on the. Yeah. Is he here too? There he okay, is. Okay, Ben. Oh, there you oh. are. Okay. Thank you. I would just echo exactly what Pat said. Um, you know, this is uh, everything Paul said is right on the money. This is a, a clearly successful policy um, in terms of getting folks engaged. There's obviously things that we need to take into consideration, um, you know, for doing this again, things like how to help town clerks process these ballots uh, when they come in, um, better uh, voter education around um, you know, what the expectation is, but like what ballot am I sending back, particularly in the primaries uh, and uh, things like that. So things we can do to change the design of the ballot to make it more clear, you know, what I'm supposed to be doing. All of those are, are positive things and can help um, on the fringes of this, this problem. But I think this is a clearly, you know, successful program that, you know, we, we should support. Thank you, Ben. Pat? Did you? I'm sorry. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, can't tell us apart. We work too closely together, me and Ben. <laughs> um, one thing we had on our letter, which we didn't discuss last time, and no one's brought it up, but um, I'm, I'm assuming this comes out of the Secretary of State's office, is enforcement of known voter fraud. If we were to actually pursue um, some voter fraud that we know might exist, I think that would clearly deter others 
from um, messing around with the system and making it um, as uh, fraud free as possible so that uh, voters really feel confident in, in what's being done and what the process is. So thank you. Yeah, and yeah. I think just to add to that real quick, um, you know, and th this is not because we think that there's widespread voter fraud. Uh, there's obviously no evidence of that. But the problem is when you have people out there that's like, I, I know of this instance and, you know, see them complaining about it, um, you know, out in public, it erodes the um, integrity of the election. Right? right. So so dealing with those problems that we might actually know about and pursuing them, um, you know, and, and if people see us doing that that helps to protect the integrity of our election. Great. So, um, and that's just one other like, commentary on, on um, you know, elections in general and, and, and whatnot. But I think that that helps to protect the integrity of the election as in, if we do pursue those rare instances we do know of. Right, agreed. Good. Thank you, I added that to the, the oh, list. Thank you, that, Madam Chair. Yeah, I'm sorry I didn't have that on there before. I don't know why. No problem, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Is that comes out of the Secretary of State's office, does it not for um, for uh, seeking out and, and uh, identifying people who might be handling? No, I think it's the Attorney General's office. Oh, it is. Oh, OK. okay but cool. um, we, uh, there, we, we can talk about how that how that might. I just think work. once or it's, twice people might yeah. pay attention and quit fooling around. Even shaming. I think that'd be good. <laughs> So, Stand out with a billboard. Yeah. <laughs> We're happy All to right. see that, Madam Chair, whenever whenever the committee wants to hear about it. Yeah, I I, I want to just kind of talk about the general concept first of, of it. And I noted that as one of the issues that we should address. So I'll go to Lila. Thank you. Uh, Lila Richardson of the League of Women Voters. Um, Paul Burns, uh, described the fact that the league was one of the signatories to the list of recommendations that um, he submitted at the beginning of the process. And he's really gone over the, the major points that we're concerned about. Uh, we're very, very supportive of any system that helps uh, more voters participate in the process, which we think is absolutely one of the most important things um, that Vermonters can do is to is per, to participate in the elections um, and make their voices known. Um, the uh, question of, about um, how this relates to uh, education is really important to the league. Uh, the league is very involved with voter education on, in a nonpartisan way with uh, trying to uh, support people by getting information about the various candidates, candidate forums um, widely available. I do think that um, having this uh, system where people are mail their uh, ballots helps to have an important education function because it, it makes people aware sometimes of issues or candidates they hadn't thought about that much. It gives them time <clears throat> to research uh, what their options are in races that they might not have, you know, have focused on before. Uh, there's a lot of information out there. Um, it's a good time frame for people to get the ballots at the beginning of the period and to have time to do that. Um, and we think it worked very well under, as Paul said, very, very difficult circumstances of the pandemic. We'd like to see the system be made permanent. Great. Thank you. Audrey, would you like to weigh in? Sure, thank you so much, Madam Chair. Um, committee members, thank you for your time and attention. This is such a um, near and dear to my heart, um, but also to the work that I do. Um, the National Voted Home Institute is a, is a nonprofit, um, nonpartisan entity that works on this exact issue. Um, and it's not often that I actually get to come to a state and say, you should make the jump and you should mail ballots to everyone. Um, not everyone has the, the really spectacular foundation, uh, security processes, dedicated clerks, um, and you know, all of that, that, that ecosystem that serves as the foundation for an elections um, system that, that can work in this way. So uh, hats off to the Secretary of State and the clerks and, 
and uh, you all for, for making that happen. Um, so that is my recommendation. I think you should, should keep the policy. It, it works, um, it is secure, it is more accessible, uh, it is safer from a health perspective. Um, and year over year, long term, you actually start seeing you know, large cost benefits um, uh, as you don't have to place, replace as much equipment, things like that. Um, and the security aspects um, are just currently under the technology that we have, they're just unbeatable. Paper ballots are great. Um, and they make sure that, that, that our most important institutions um, are secure. So, um, and, and to touch on something that you mentioned earlier, Senator White, um, to talk about people participating civically um, is, is so important. And, and these sorts of policies, they actually pull people farther down the ballot. So you start seeing higher rates of voting um, all the way at it, whatever the, the sort of last question on your ballot might be. Um, and so you're seeing that people are spending more time thinking about issues, being critical of what does their government look like? How do they want to express their, um, their voice in that government? And we are just so thrilled to see uh, the, the things that Vermont has done to make this successful. But we want to stress that some of the other issues that we've been, that this committee has been discussing recently are important to not only um, to, to secure the process, but make it more accessible. Just mailing someone a ballot uh, is not always enough. Things like the cure processes and ballot tracking, all of those pieces will fit together to make the gears of this machine work in a way that is most effective. And, and we're just so happy um, to lend our support and, and be here to take any questions or um, be supportive in, a, in any way that might cross your mind. So thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, so uh, we'll jump to the parties. Martha, are you here? There you are. Um, yes, thank you all for inviting me and, and for taking up these issues. Uh, I don't think I have very much to add that hasn't already been said. I completely agree with Paul Burns' remarks and uh, some of the other remarks that have been made. I think it was highly successful. I think people like it when something works in government and works for them and makes it gives them more options. and. Um, I think the only reason to change it would be if there had been a bad experience and we needed to fix it in some way, but I think people like the continuity and they don't like it when government keeps changing the procedures and rules all the time. I, I'm a tax preparer, so I, I notice it a lot in that field. Um, but no, I would say um, that it worked very well. We should, we should keep it. Great, thank you. Bruce? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Bruce Olson, Vermont Democratic Party. Uh, we certainly uh, and strongly support a uh, vote by mail, primarily because it increases voter participation and as a consequence uh, makes our democracy stronger. Um, if, but we, at the same point, we want to maintain the ability of voters to vote in person. We know that for many people, that's a time-honored uh, tradition that they want to maintain. And if we can do it safely, hopefully after this uh, pandemic is behind us, we want to continue that. But vote by mail certainly gives working families, it gives the elderly, it gives people that live far away from polling places a greater opportunity to participate in the process. We think that's a good thing. Our only criticism really of the vote by mail that we saw in this last election was that it was there was no curing process. And you know that's a real frustration for a voter when they're legally uh, register to vote and then they make one mistake on their ballot and then their ballot doesn't count and we think that that can be corrected fairly easily. Uh, as opposed as this question about fraud, we did not see anything that, uh, that indicated there was any fraud in uh, the vote by mail election that we just had. Uh, we feel that was free of fraud, it increased participation and um, it, with a curing process it'll make it it'll work a lot better. We do want to uh, send a thank you to the town clerks and to the Secretary of State's office who implemented this almost on the fly. You know, this is, as people have pointed out, something that a year ago we weren't even thinking about. And we were able to very successfully implement it because of the clerks in the Secretary of State's office. Um, so other things that the only, th I would just echo what Paul Burns said. We really, I think, hit the nail on the head as to all the reasons why uh, we should do this and we'd be happy to uh, work with this committee and the legislature to make sure that we can uh, implement vote by mail going forward. 
Thank you. Great, thank you. So clerks, or let's go to VLCT first. <laughs> if you're gonna, you might be more specific, VLCT. Sorry. Um, yeah, we, we're here to back up the clerks, to be honest with you, and we're not talking about local elections. So I think the, um, we don't have a necessarily a position on, on this, more so that if this were to become common practice that the clerks have just as much, <clears throat> excuse me, help and, um, and resources that were given this go around because I think that's where the rubber meets the road and that's why it was so successful. So, um, you know, the, if everyone works as a team as it has been the last year, uh, things work out well. So I we're here to support what the clerks say and anything that they need um, we'll stand behind, um, but we don't actually have a position to hold on this, but because um, it doesn't impact um, local elections as, as you're referring to, but um, it's been a success. And from all we've heard from the, the clerks, the, um, the Secretary of State's office was excellent. The public education was excellent. And um, that's, uh, that's what we need to continue to do moving forward. All right, thank you. Uh, clerks, which of, Carol? So um, I, we haven't polled the membership of the association, but but uh, looking at the what the responses were like uh, pre and post November, um, I think that the majority of clerks really supported it. Um, there were some clerks who were concerned about the loss of local control and local involvement with regards to mailing out ballots. But personally, I don't want to mail six thousand ballots out myself. Um, but I do know that that is a, a concern that some of the clerks have. Most of my concerns are process related, which means they're fixable, um, you know, or or can be can be addressed. Um, it's been mentioned before talking about, you know, cleaning up the, the checklist, consistent information on the checklist, particularly with regards to how voters can access my voter page, um, the need for the information to be consistent so they can get onto their there, um, possibly tying into the national change of address uh, system so that we can keep our uh, mailing addresses as up to date as possible. Um, codifying the processes associated with voters who choose to vote their ballot, but then bring their voted ballot to the polls, making sure that we're, we're using the, the right process for that. How to handle ballots that are returned is undeliverable. What's the best way to deal with that? Is there a way to reprocess them? Um, you know, what, how, how should we handle those? Um, we talked about uh, just earlier this afternoon, we talked about ways to um, mesh together um, local and general elections. And yet, what would the impact be if we were trying to hold a local election at the same time as a general election? Would our local election ballots have to be mailed by us? They would clearly have to be mailed to everybody. And how would that work out? What, what would that kind of a, a process look like? Um, it, it, it's more, it, it, there's a pretty significant culture um, shift with regards to clerks in that uh, we'd be seeing a lot more pre-election work um, and hopefully less work on election day with less people coming through the door and and culture shifts can always be a, a little problematic. Um, but I but as I said, 99% of that is is process related and those things can be addressed. Great. Thank you, Carol. John? Sure. Um, well, first of all, I want to thank you all uh, for, you know, already had a bit of a conversation about, you know, considering this issue without, you know, with, you know, and as far as the concerns about the structure of the schools do that, that doesn't preclude a greater conversation about, about cooperating. I'm glad there's some, some daylight there. I'm also glad there's some daylight in terms of uh, uh, maybe moving back up some of those filing deadlines a little bit to give us more room again for local, for town meetings. And those were my two personal biggest concerns about this entire question, because having gone through it, it went really well. Um, November was a, a, a lot easier for us than August, which was the postcard driven one. Um, now, you know, with us, 
The big change was workflow, obviously, and those were two different. And this one we're coming up now, I've got, um, you know, we're doing mail-in voting for a town meeting. They all my ballots just hit today. Um, that's two and a half weeks out as opposed to, you know, the previous election. So I think the full piece of information, um, you know, that would be available would, you know, come after crossover when it's too late to get that, you know, but having said that people seem to like it, I would just say, you know, the different clerks have can have even dramatically different workflows. So I think it would be very important to keep the issue somewhat fluid or dynamic, or at least, you know, stay in touch as this, as this develops, as this go on, I think it will create some real change if this really gets set in in a long-term way to some of the way the clerks operate. And so I think that'll be an ongoing discussion that comes right back around to what Gwyn was saying, uh, and that's resources. I think resources, resources, resources. Uh, that's a big part of how this worked was that we had the resources to support us. And without those resources, <clears throat> um, it gets to be a much more challenging conversation. Good, okay, thank you. So now um, what I think we'll do is uh, go to the Secretary of State's office and I'm gonna ask this question, uh, kind of two questions. First of all, a very simple question that just requires a yes or no answer. Do you support continuing to do mail out balloting for the general election? And the second part then is assuming that you do, um, which of the issues that have been brought up and that need to be <clears throat> statutorily defined and which of them are just in that group of things that say um, that, that you'll work with the town clerks. I'm not sure how to, how to put that, but there are some things that we need to do and then some things that we need to give you and the town clerks authority to do. And what we need to know is what we need to do. Did that make any sense to anybody? A little bit, thank you, Madam Chair. As far as the first question goes, the answer is a very clear yes, and it's really gratifying to hear all of the support. So much harmony on, uh, on, a, on a committee discussion about a, a, a bill is, is a really great to see. Um, I won't go into much more. You, you asked for a yes or no question, the, question, the uh, answer, yes or no answer. The answer is a definite yes. I have a little bit more to say if the, if the chair would allow it. Yeah, I suppose. <laughs> About why, and I thank you for that. Um, just because, you know, we we said all through the 2020 elections, vote by mail was going to be safe, simple, and secure. We tried to get it, make it catchy, and have people uh, remember that voter education piece was so important. So safe, simple, secure. Sign, seal, and send your ballot. Well, I'm going to add a fourth S to that. It was safe, simple, secure, and a success. And that's why I think mm -hmm. we're talking about it the way that we are today. People had a really powerful and positive experience with that. And as was said by multiple others just before me, we achieved a record shattering voter participation in the midst of a pandemic. And uh, we accomplished all the goals that we set out for. Um, we set, sent a ballot to every active registered voter. It wasn't an easy process and we couldn't do it the same way again. It's actually close to a miracle that we were able to pull it off with the resources that we had. And that was thanks to the really hard work of our elections division, our smallest in the nation elections division, the really hard work and wonderful partnership that we developed with the town clerks. We were constantly on the line with a, a group of clerks to figure out the best way to do this. And, and that goes to the second part of your question, I think is there are a lot of things that I think we can work through administratively just with the clerks continuing that, that partnership. We've grown together over the last year and kind of been through battle together. And, and I think are working uh, together more effectively than, than I can ever remember us doing so in the past. So that's a, a really good sign for what's to come. Um, as Paul pointed out and some others pointed out, Vermonters overwhelmingly embraced 
voting by mail. Over 75% of uh, Vermonters voted early. Those are just plain amazing numbers. And this election was one of the smoothest elections that we've ever seen. It really came off without a hitch. Was amazing for how um, how worried we were, how many things we thought could go wrong, pulling off vote by mail in less than a year. So post uh, post November, we've received a lot of um, shifts in opinion, uh, accolades for the management and oversight of a really safe, secure, and accessible election. Uh, we had a number of folks in the legislature who were opposed, and now have kind of come around to see the benefits of vote by mail. Um, we had the governor kind of wanting us to wait and see and wasn't sure about vote by mail. And now he's fully on board and, and recommending it for March town meetings. Uh, there were some clerks who had had questions and some that still do, but I think we're seeing more support there than we did. Um, and a lot of that thanks should also go to all those partners who are on the call who did that voter education um, and really got the word out and made sure people uh, knew how to return their ballots, knew where to return their ballots and had a successful experience. So bottom line is people liked it. People liked it a lot. And we know that this experience shows that voting by mail has a future here in Vermont. We think it ought to be a permanent fixture after crushing those participation records. And the Secretary of State, uh, has always been of the view that our democracy is stronger and more representative when more people vote. And it's worked well for decades in other states. It can work really well here. We saw it work well in 2020. So now to the, the, the things that I think we've already talked about putting in a bill, that I think go with this vote by mail discussion. And as you've worked through that list, we've already um, checked off a bunch of those. I think uh, that 30 day early processing is really important and we have broad agreement on that. And because we had that early processing available, that's what made it so smooth. That's what made us be able to report all of our results uh, or 95%, 97% of our results on election night and didn't become an issue like it did in other states. So that 30 day early processing is a really big piece of this that we wanna see codified. Um, drop boxes, the use of drop boxes, and uh, I think I would add to that outdoor polling places. We've, that's in there. That's in there. We've covered that, and I think that you've authorized to, uh, us to start talking to Amarin about that. That's another one that we really wanted to, um, to make sure was in there. Um, sorry, there's just a couple more. Um, and now we have, I think, broad agreement on central mailing coming out of the Secretary of State's office, which is a, a real key piece of this. And the ballot curing is the other piece that um, we've had some conversation around that I think is really important to make vote by mail as successful as possible. So we've got those pieces. The, the, the one piece that I would add is an additional position for the Secretary of State's office. You've heard a lot of people talk about having the appropriate resources to pull this off. Um, and again, it was, we were very fortunate that we have such a dedicated elections team because we asked things of them that we never should have asked of any, any state employee. The hours they put in, the weekends that they put in, the family time that they gave up, the vacations that they gave up for, for nearly nine or, nine or 10 months straight um, was um, just more than we ever should have asked of anyone. And so we can't go through it that way again we have to have another position for the Secretary of State's office in order to move to vote by mail successfully and still keep uh, Will Senning from turning in his uh, resignation letter. Um, and then the last piece for us all, I think to really think hard about is that vote by mail is wonderful. It gets more people involved in the process, but it does come at a cost. Those mailings come at a cost. Uh, so that's one of the things that we really need to think about is what, what that will cost and what that future funding source for uh, the mailing of all those ballots and the processing of all those ballots includes. And that also includes some resources for the clerks themselves who um, with those resources can run a more successful election. Um, so I guess in, in closing, uh, you know, the, one of the thing I did want to mention is that, that we need to be laser focused on the accuracy of the checklist and people have, have brought that up as well, that we're going to have to take um, more time and more attention paid to making that checklist and those mailings as accurate as they possibly can be. We learned a lot 
And I think we cleaned up those checklists a lot in 2020, but there's always more work to be done. We wanna make sure that those things are accurate and that those ballots are going to the right place. So I guess to round it out, uh, voting by mail is safe, simple, secure, and was a success. And voting as the foundation of our democracy, we need to be do everything that we can to ensure that every eligible voter who wishes to cast a ballot and can. So giving them that option of voting by mail, of dropping off at a drop box, of coming in and voting early, or still being able to come and vote at a polling place is just uh, something that we, we really should do and we should give that option to our voters. So we fully support moving ahead with a bill to make it a, a permanent fixture in Vermont. And I wanna say thank you to this committee for all the work that you've done to support us in this. We couldn't have done it without that. Thank you to all the folks on the line the clerks especially, all of the stakeholders who did a great job of working with us and getting the word out to Vermonters. Uh, it's really gratifying to be come out on the other end of this and have it have been such a success and see uh, the groundswell of support for making this a permanent thing. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Will, you wanna add some stuff? Yeah, if you don't mind. No, um, please do. Although thank you, Chris, that Deputy Secretary Winters just did a really nice job uh, summarizing some of this stuff. That's why he gets paid the big bucks. Um, <laughs> more eloquent than I will be, I'll, tr I'll try to be close and I'll try to be brief too, because I think we've covered a lot of this ground, thankfully. Um, I wanna first just say thanks to everybody for your kind words again. I really do appreciate it um, for myself and the rest of my staff who dug in as much as I did. And I just wanted to say in that regard that there's been a lot of praise on myself, my team, and the clerks, all rightfully so. I want to give a little praise to Secretary Condos, who showed decisive leadership at the beginning. Um, I don't do anything without his approval and authority, and decisions had to be made and made quickly, um, and then advocated for, and I thought he really stepped up. Um, also, I wanted to note and remind, so one thing that Paul mentioned, I wanted to go back to, which is that um, other states who have stood up vote by mail systems and how long they have spent doing so, five, six, three, four years perfecting it um, and getting all the processes and pieces put in place together. And the fact that we didn't have that luxury last year, but I think that, and that, um, that was one of the reasons why we advocated for the approach that you guys have taken, which is not to bite off more than we can chew at this time. Um, but to do what we think is doable right now to move us to, to continue that policy, expand it, make it better over time. And I think the committee with what we've talked about just today and kind of landed on as a universe of moving forward has really um, threaded that needle appropriately at this point. Um, I think what you're suggesting we can do and we can do before 2022, um, and then we should and can have discussions about further ways to improve the system going forward, right? It's like anything else. Um, over time, we'll make it better and serve our Vermont voters better all the time as we do so. So to more specifically answer your second question, Senator White, which is, which is what um, Chris did a good job of already, I think, at least from my mind, we have good consensus on the general concept of sending out the ballots for the general election to all active voters to remind the committee you're talking about about 440, 450,000 voters, um, that those ballots will be returned directly to the clerk's offices. That's a, that's a big decision that you guys made that I think is the right one, um, again, in terms of, of taking just the steps that, we, that are appropriate right now. A lot of the states that do vote by mail do some form of central processing where they're brought back to, um, more central locations and counted in, in more volume. And I have never advocated for that and don't now. So I think having these set up to be returned to the clerks is what makes sense for Vermont right now. Um, having the postage paid in both directions. So obviously we pay the postage going out, but we want those return envelopes to be pre-postage paid and addressed back to the clerks to make it as easy as possible for people to return the ballots. And um, drop boxes. And I think the message that I have previously gotten from the committee is 
we're going to do some basic requirements around Dropboxes and leave a lot of the security and accessibility standards to either guidance or rulemaking done by the Secretary of State. I've already reached out to uh, my colleagues in a lot of the states that have Dropboxes and have gotten a flood of useful information about policies in place in those states. So Dropboxes and then, excuse me, the early processing is the big one. Um, and that is intimately tied with the opportunity to cure. And um, the basic parameters I have in my head so far coming out of the committee is um, that we would allow the clerks to do the early processing for 30 days. And when we talk about that, the step that's not allowed now that would be during that time is actually opening the certificate envelope and feeding the ballot into the tabulator or ballot box. That is what um, Carol was talking about that is, is the front end work, but then that ends up not being the back end work on election day where that otherwise would be taking place. It also enables us to get down to um, a greater level of ability to address almost all the reasons that a ballot could be defective um, by enabling the clerks to open up, take the ballots out and process them in the tabulator or ballot box. So I think expanding the that is that is optional right You're keeping that as a choice the clerk can make about what to what degree they want to process ballots but i made this point um in our last session and i'll make it again that if you pair that of course with the requirement that i would suggest at this point um that the clerk needs to within 72 hours make a determination of whether the ballot is defective or not that's where you're putting the new burden on the clerks because that requires action at a time that they don't have control over that could be as early as 30 days, could be as late as the day before too. It depends when they receive a ballot. But as soon as they're receiving a ballot, they're then on the clock to take action on that ballot. And as we've talked about, it's really the only way to have a meaningful opportunity to cure um, and, a, and a, a fair one to all voters across towns. So um, then there was, we discussed it. Um, we kind of, the, the discussion, I don't think completely completed itself last time about when, at what point you stop requiring, oh, excuse me, I'll back up, that the notification that would result from that review process would be a postcard mailing. And that the Secretary of State's office will develop these postcards that the clerks hopefully have sitting in a little easy to access place on their desk pre-posted that when they determine a ballot's defective, they quickly address the postcard and send it in the mail to the voter um, at that time. We had discussed also that voters, and I think the way I would probably suggest this happens is that it's specific on their absentee ballot application for that election if they have one, that they would, they would take that notification by phone call or text message or email if they provide that information to the clerk. Um, I, I'd, I'd be curious Carol's thoughts about that because I think part of the idea too was that it, I think it'd almost be easier for the clerks to just send a postcard than try and be making phone calls and writing emails um, if the postcards are there and ready and pre-posted. So I think we'd wanna write it in such a way that it could be up to the clerk what means of notification they use and that they could use one of those others if provided. They also could just decide to do a postcard to everybody if that's the easiest thing for them, but they have to notify everybody. And so that if they don't have the information, they have to send the postcard. Then there was the discussion of when that necessity to send a postcard might stop in advance of the election, given the mailing times. I think 10 days had been talked about I personally think that even at 10 days, you could put a postcard in the mail to a Vermonter and it'll be there within three days and give them a meaningful chance to come cure a ballot. So the more I had thought about it, I thought that that might move closer to say five days before the election. And Senator White, I do not know the level of detail you wanted me to get into now, but you, you asked the appropriate question, right, of what you address in the statute and what you don't. Yep. And I'm trying to get to the ones I think you probably would address in the statute. And then if you leave the details of how those are addressed up to the clerks and I and Amarin, and then you guys take a look at what we present and say, no, I want seven days. No, I want 
uh, three here, that makes sense to me if it does to you. Yeah, I think that's where we, because um, we, we need to we need to get to the actual things that need to be in statute and and have and have Amarin the ability to to draft them up so that then we can make sure that we're talking about the same thing. And if there are things that um, need to be in the statutes that we didn't address, right? Th that you need to bring I'll that get to up a to couple of too. those because there are okay. a couple of those I think. Um, but there are a couple too that I think would be better dealing with administratively. And I guess I'll say to you in general, um, there's a lot that needs to be addressed outside mm -hmm. of what we're talking about in the details of this, of course, that was all I went through last year, but none of it's worthy of putting into statute, I don't think. Um, okay. Carol talked about how you handle undeliverable mm -hmm. ballots that come back to you. And I think that might be worth putting in statute also. And I think that could be part of and I haven't thought this through entirely. The other part of the curing and defective ballot conversation that we had is um, sort of appropriate uh, recording of that information in our election management system. And I want to um, simplify the categories, Carol, of return, right? It should just be that it's returned and counted, it's returned and defective, and possibly a third would be returned and undeliverable. So that I, as a voter, I'm sitting here, I haven't gotten my automatic ballot yet. And I can go and check the my voter page and say, oh, it went back to the clerk undeliverable. I gotta get down there and see what the problem with the address was or vote in person at the office. Try and simplify those categories and put in the statute that that's part of the action they need to take. So they need to, when they make the determination, say it's defective, they need to put the postcard in the mail or notify the voter by the other means if they choose to and have them or and, not or, and mark in the election management system the status of that ballot return, putting in that it was one of those three that I just talked about. And that that happens in that same 32 hour period too. Um, the, hopefully there's less instances of those undeliverable ballots and it gets to the discussion about the checklist, but I think many of the clerks have used the information that they got from ballots coming back to them to make informed decisions about challenging voters going forward. And if we're just doing it to active voters, they aren't going to get mailed a ballot if they're a challenged voter and that's not going to get bounced back to the clerk. So hopefully there's less of that, but there will always be some of it and it's important to address it. The other one, Carol, I forget, I don't think you had flagged this one, but it, it came up a lot and I think it might be worth actually putting in the statute also is a statement about what, how you handle people who register after the mailing goes out. And I think that those should potentially be put into two baskets, which is that if it's a true first time registrant for the first time in Vermont, you go ahead and automatically send a ballot to that person because you're not worried that there's already been a ballot sent to them in the statewide mailing that happened however long before that. But if instead they've, they were previously registered in another town and are moving to your town, that I would like to craft some language that says a ballot isn't sent to that person until the status of the ballot was previously sent by the state is determined. Either they bring it back and here's my Barton ballot. As you can see, it's unvoted. And then they can contact the Barton clerk and say, take them off your list and take their absentee activity away, whatever it might be. But just to determine that it's not out there, hasn't been returned in the past town. And I'm happy to talk with Carol more about the details of how we would phrase that. But that caused a lot of confusion and concern on the part of the clerks, um, knowing that a ballot may have been issued in the previous town. <clears throat> I'm getting there, first time registrants, movers, cure. Da, 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 da. I think I've covered most of it, Senator White. I wanted to note a couple things though, in terms of comments that have been made. Yeah, on the voter checklist, number one, that last year made a lot of progress on the voter checklist. Number two, that we're finally getting um, engaged with this group, Eric, that I've told you all about over the spring and summer this year for further cleaning of the checklist. And um, yesterday I had a conversation with some folks advocating for the possible expansion of automatic voter registration to some of the um, um, social service agencies, particularly Medicaid. And the fact that they met, that might move us forward in terms of more frequent address updates to Medicaid recipients who are already um, registered on the checklist. 
which was making sense to me when we were having that conversation yesterday. They visit their, their Medicaid um, provider more than more frequently than the DMV even, for instance. So that's constantly on our mind, updating the voter checklist and making it more accurate. Um, last, in terms of the um, pursuance of voter fraud, I think that the phrase used, and I'm, I'm um, not being defensive here at all, was known cases of voter fraud. And I just, my answer to that is if I am really presented with evidence of a known actual voter fraud, I will forward that to the attorney general's office. The, the Ben mentioned sort of public proclamations of it. If I really saw a public proclamation that was actual voter fraud, I would follow up with that person and try and contact them and say, what are you talking about? Do you have evidence of this? A lot of the voter fraud proclamations that we saw last year were ballots being delivered to residences for either pr uh, previous residents or deceased persons, um, et cetera. And we just you know, continue to make the point, it's not voter fraud until somebody picks up that ballot, perjures themselves on the envelope and sends it back to the clerk. And if I hear about that, I'm reporting it to the attorney general's office. Um, but that's, that was a side issue. I really appreciate the common ground that the folks in this room have reached on vote by mail. Um, I think it is smart policy. I can't tell you the number of people who've contacted me and said, I don't typically vote, but because the ballot was sent and put in front of me and put in my living room, yeah, I, I filled it out and sent it back and it felt great. And I had no idea it was that easy. And um, those are the feel good stories. And that's why we saw the, the crushing of the voter turnout records that we saw in November. So if you think I've accurately kind of framed up how we're moving forward, then I look forward to bringing back some uh, pen on paper and starting to parse through the details. Thank you, that's um, Senator Clarkson. That was great. That was great. The whole thing was, that was just, that was terrific. It was wonderful to, to listen to and just uh, such a, an extraordinary effort. Um, two questions. What, you know, uh, we, we have a specific number and I just need a reminder of how many people actually voted. We have, we got 73%. What was the 73% actual number? It was at 328. No, it was more than that. 370. So that's more than 73% if you're looking at 450. 370. Okay, great. And my other question is, how many did we actually take, how many effectively did we take off the checklist as a result of the work around the, the uh, postcard and the primary? I can't answer that yet. And we and can't, okay. Part of the reason is you're, you're primarily not just taking those people off, you're sending them the notice letter. You're challenging them on notice. Yep. Okay, and you're challenging them. So you yep. were, and do we know how many that is? No, I mean, I could tell you how many, I, I would have to get back to you. I could tell you how many have been challenged since the general election. Those aren't necessarily all because of the postcards, but it would still be informative to you. Yeah, I think it would be. I think that would be helpful for us because when we're talking about improving uh, uh, the checklist, it would be interesting for us to know how effective this incredible effort, what it resulted in, in terms of how many additional challenged uh, vote uh, people that that would be great thanks and senator clarkson just to, uh, on a couple of those numbers i don't want to leave leave them out there i want people to be clear that the 75 ish percent was of people who actually voted so voted by mail no so, i i got that it was that 73 percent of, of the total check of the registered voters had, had voted i thought that, no so the total number of voters are somewhere around five hundred thousand. Oh. The 75% was of those 370,000 who voted, 75% of them voted early, voted by mail. Right, I got that. And but the total, the total number of people who voted were five. No, we have, I thought you testified that there were 450,000 people on our checklist. Those were active voters after you pull out right. the okay. of about 40 to 50,000 challenged voters, people on the challenge list. And the, okay. Right. But Perfect. I'm and sorry, I just, 370 I, is about 75% of yes. 490 of our total universe right. of voters. 
then there were 370,000 ballots cast this year. That's 75% of our total universe of voters. It's, it's great. So yeah. I would just like to, on a point of personal gratitude, uh, I did have a, a, a constituent that Will and Chris were very generous in uh, working with who, who had thought there was fraud and uh, ended up, it, it ended up sort of disappearing because it was one of those issues. It was other town or somebody who died. It was, a, it was not a fraud issue per se. It was a, you know, ballot going to another address or, you know, to somebody who'd moved. I can't remember what it ended up being, but it wasn't fraud. Thank you. Welcome. Still, I, I am going to, I'm gonna um, ask the committee if they have any um, questions or concerns or anything about this, and then we'll try to get this um, written up in a draft form. But first, I just want to acknowledge that um, the issue of uh, putting um, more burden, and I acknowledge that that is what we're doing here by request requiring uh, town clerks to send out some kind of a postcard or some kind of a notification to people um, who have a uh, defective ballot returned. But I'd like to point out the, um, the I think Paul, did you, you sent this to everybody? He, he did a, an analysis of how many, what that meant for each town. And uh, I don't know if everybody got that, but it tells there on how many, how many towns received defective ballots and how many they received and the, the kind of burden that we would be putting on the town clerks. And it, it clearly is more of a burden in a larger town because, but Paul, did you send that to everybody? It's posted on our website, I think. Okay. It Isn't is, okay. that the, the, the missive you sent where everybody signed it at the bottom? No, no, um, no. This, is, okay. this is more recent and I'm not sure that everybody got that, uh, Senator oh, White. Sorry. So. Okay. If you could um, both send that to everybody and also to Gail to post it on the website because it gives numbers of, um, and I'm not sure if it's every town, but it gives numbers of in different towns, how many, defective ballots, what that would mean in terms of sending out a postcard. And in many towns, it meant nothing. There weren't any returned. And in some, there were five and in some 10. So it isn't as if we're asking every town clerk to send out 250 postcards. So I, th I thought that was very instructive. I'll, I'll, I'll send that uh, information to Gail and to the full committee. Thank you. Thank you. So committee uh, will. Quick comment. I think that's very useful data. I want to know it's, a, it's only as is reported to us by the clerk. So yeah, I always I put that note on there. And I wanted to, that discussion though, made me think of something, and Carol and John, if you're listening. Um, does the committee want to give me any direction on how we would treat clerks with um, way less than regular office hours. So I would probably suggest some language that said within 72 hours or the next time you have regular office hours, potentially say the ballot lands on a Wednesday, you're not gonna ping them if they're not in until the next Monday. Yeah, I think you need to have that flexibility. Because yeah. we don't want town clerks to feel that they have to every day go in and check their mail if they- Do I have to be checking? That was the question yeah. you yeah. would get. Yep. So do committee members have any questions or con comments or anything to any of the people who've spoken to us or about any of the issues right now? No. Nope. Senator Polina? You're muted. Sorry about that. I just wanted to add my kudos to Will and Chris for all the work they've done. It's really incredible achievement. You know, others have said it, but I feel the need to make it clear that I really appreciate what they've done. Thanks. I have, I have to say that if you're, if you're doing this for the 2022 election and it's you five and you have one more person, you're going to feel like you're on vacation because <laughs> you're going to have so much time to prepare and do it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> 
We got to get redistricting done between now and then too, by the way. <laughs> That's going to be a fun one. We know where Southern Vermont is going to be down to Massachusetts. Um, any other committee members want to add their thoughts or concerns or anybody else? I don't see any hands waving. So what I would say is um, Amron and Will and whoever needs to here, um, we, if, if it's possible to have, is it, tell me if this is possible, to have some kind of a, a draft by Wednesday of next week? Given the holiday, that might be a little difficult. What holiday? Uh, Monday is a state holiday. Oh, um, I forgot. Um, I know, that's because we never get it. <laughs> right. And if we had an election day holiday, we wouldn't get that either. <laughs> we, we only have holidays when we don't go shopping or interact in the public at all. Let's see. Um, so given that, would it make more sense for us to switch some days next week then and do elections on um, a different day? Could, could we do that, do you think, by um, Friday? Yes. Is that is that reasonable? We haven't we just switched everybody to oh next week, right? No, next week. So I'm that looking at, I'm looking at Amarin. I mean yeah. <laughs> yeah, I am too. <laughs> it's hard to know until we're in it how long it's going to I would say Friday is a possibility. <laughs> Yeah, I would say I the next week is is more comfortable, but we can see how far we can get. Certainly, not this Friday, right? No, next Friday, and right. and I think the Secretary of State might have some language already around some of these. A possibility too that comes to mind would be maybe we have enough done to discuss what we have okay. done yeah. next week. Yep. If it's right. not everything, but it's enough for a session on Thursday or Friday would be preferable to me. Mm -hmm. But I think we can certainly have enough for the committee to discuss at that point. I Let's agree. Let's aim for Friday then. Gail, we'll have to, you and I will have to meet and make some changes here, but let's aim for Friday then. And um, we'll do as much as, as much as we can. And hopefully everybody will be with us again so that we can look at the details and and the way um, we tend to uh, do these is if we have a, the draft and we're going through them, if we're all in agreement on an issue, we'll just check that issue off. We're not gonna talk about it again. There's no point if we're all in agreement. And uh, so if the majority of the committee agrees on, and then we'll look at the bill as a whole afterwards, okay? That work for everybody? Yeah, that sounds terrific. And I just okay. want to point out that Ben Kingsley is in the crest running here. He's added another quite beautiful crest. I know, I see that. I don't know so, what that is. I mean, is. we're going to go from pick photos. I mean, you know, that's like yesterday. Now we're into crests. Now we'll... That's high praise. I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> well, Carol's is pretty rocking. I, you know, I don't think I can compete with Carol's. I... <laughs> <laughs> <I'll> be honest. <laughs> okay. So the cut, see the competition is on. Yeah. Uh oh, everybody's <laughs> going to be getting up um, crests. So, anything else, committee, that we need to? No, I think this was good work today. All set. Thank yep, you. Good. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Gail, can we stay on for just a little while? That would be I got, I, Are you okay with letting the rest of us go? Yeah, unless you want to stay on. I mean, you're welcome no, to have, stay on and talk about I'm, next week, but. I'm going thanks. to stop the, the YouTube then. <laughs>